The program on this tape is numbered A303-5, stroke and it's part of the Open University course, The Problems of Philosophy. It is linked with Units 7 to 8 of that course, and its title is A Debate on the Existence of God. This program is edited from a famous radio discussion between Bertrand Russell and F.C. Coppleston, S.J. This discussion is reproduced in full in the set book, The Existence of God, edited by John Hick. The program is introduced by Stuart Brown, Senior Lecturer in Philosophy at the Open University. BBC production is by Richard Callanan. The program starts after the tone signal with the voice of Stuart Brown. Its approximate duration is 19 minutes. In 1948, the BBC broadcast a debate between Bertrand Russell and F.C. Copleston concerning the existence of God. Lord Russell, who died in 1970, will be remembered for many reasons, not least for his important contribution to the development of logic. Father Copleston is a Jesuit priest, now principal of Heathrop College and professor of the history of philosophy in the University of London. Russell's position in the debate is that of an agnostic. Copleston's position is that of a believer who holds that the existence of God can be proved. We shall listen in a moment to an edited portion of this debate, that part in which Russell and Copleston discuss what is sometimes called the argument from contingency. This is a form of cosmological argument and I expect you will notice several points of resemblance between the argument offered by Copleston and the cosmological argument of Richard Taylor discussed in the correspondence material. Like any form of cosmological argument, the argument from contingency begins with an empirical premise, one whose truth is known through experience. This premise is, of course, that there are contingent things. A contingent thing, according to Copleston, is one which does not contain within itself the reason for its existence. If we are to explain why a particular contingent thing exists, we must mention, in so doing, some other thing or things on which its existence depends. Those who accept the argument from contingency hold that we must, in the long run, have recourse to some non-contingent or necessary thing if we are to explain the existence of contingent things. Either the principle of sufficient reason is false, and there is in the end no sufficient explanation why contingent things exist, or else there is something having a property peculiar to God, namely, of containing within itself the reason for its existence. If we find it unacceptable that the existence of contingent things should in the end have no explanation, we must, it is argued, conclude that there is a God. We join the discussion at the point where Copleston states the argument from contingency in the form in which he himself favours it. Suppose that I give a brief um, statement and then we go on to discuss it. Well, for clarity's sake, I divide the argument <coughs> into distinct stages. Uh, first of all, I should say, we know that there are at least some beings in the world which do not contain in themselves the reason for their existence. For example, I depend on my parents and now on the air, on the food, and so on. Now, secondly, the world is simply the real or imagined totality or aggregate of individual objects, none of which contain in themselves alone the reason of their existence. There isn't any world distinct from the objects which form it any more than the human race is something apart from the members. Therefore, I should say, since objects or events exist, and since no object of experience contains within itself the reason of its existence, this reason, um, the totality of objects, must have a reason external to itself, and that reason must be an existent being. Well, this being is either itself the reason for its own existence, or it is not. If it is, well and good. If not, then we must proceed further. But if we proceed to infinity in that sense, then there's no explanation of existence at all. So, I should say, in order to explain existence, we must come to a being which contains within itself the reason for its own existence, that is to say, which cannot not exist. 
This uh, raises a great many points, and it's not altogether easy to know where to begin. But I think that perhaps in answering your argument, the best point with which to begin is the question of a necessary being. The word necessary, I should maintain, can only be applied significantly to propositions, and in fact only to such as are analytic, that is to say, such as it is self-contradictory to deny. I could only admit a necessary being if there were a being whose existence it is self-contradictory to deny. Uh, I should uh, like to know whether you would accept Leibniz's division of propositions into truths of reason and truths of fact, the former, the truths of reason, being necessary. I certainly should not subscribe to what seems to be Leibniz's idea of truths and reason and truths of fact, since it would appear that for him there are in the long run only analytic propositions. I don't want to uphold the whole philosophy of Leibniz. I have made use of his argument from contingent to necessary being, basing the argument on the principle of sufficient reason, simply because it seems to me a brief and clear formulation of what is the, in my opinion, the fundamental metaphysical argument for God's existence. But, to my mind, a necessary proposition has got to be analytic. I don't see what else it can mean. And analytic propositions are always complex and logically somewhat late. Rational animals are animals is an analytic proposition. But a proposition such as, this is an animal, can never be analytic. Well, in fact, all the propositions that can be analytic are somewhat late in the build-up of propositions. Take the proposition, if there is a contingent being, then there is a necessary being. I consider that that proposition, hypothetically expressed, is a necessary proposition. If you are going to call every necessary proposition an analytic proposition, then in order to avoid a dispute in terminology, I will agree to call it analytic, though I don't consider it a tautological proposition. But the proposition is a necessary proposition, only on the supposition that there is a contingent being. That there is a contingent being actually existing has to be discovered by experience. And the proposition that there is a contingent being is certainly not an analytic proposition. Though once you know, I should maintain, that there is a contingent being, it follows of necessity that there is a necessary being. The difficulty of this argument is that I don't admit the idea of a necessary being and I don't admit that there is any particular meaning in calling other beings contingent. These phrases don't, for me, have a significance, except within a logic that I reject. A contingent being is a being which has not in itself the complete reason for its existence. That's what I mean by a contingent being. You know as well as I do that the existence of neither of us can be explained without reference to something or somebody outside us, our parents, for example. The necessary being, on the other hand, means a being that must and cannot not exist. You may say that there is no such being, but you will find it hard to convince me that you do not understand the terms I am using. If you do not understand them, then how can you be entitled to say that such a being does not exist, if that is what you do say? Uh, well, I will say that what you have been saying <coughs> brings us back, it seems to me, to the ontological argument that there is a being whose essence involves existence, so that his existence is analytic. That seems to me to be impossible. And uh, it raises, of course, the question, what one means by existence? Uh, and as to this, I think a subject named can never be significantly said to exist, but only a subject described. And that existence, in fact, quite definitely, is not a predicate. Well, you say, I believe, that it is bad grammar, or rather bad syntax, to say, for example, T.S. Eliot exists. One ought to say, for example, the author of Murder in the Cathedral exists. Are you going to say that the proposition, the cause of the world exists, is without meaning? You may say that the world has no cause, but I fail to see how you can say that the proposition that the cause of the world exists is meaningless. Put it in the form of a question. Has the world a cause, or does a cause of the world exist? Most people surely would understand the question, even if they don't agree about the answer. Certainly, the question, does the cause of the world exist, 
is a question that has meaning. But if you say, yes, God is the cause of the world, where using God as a proper name, then God exists will not be a statement that has meaning. That is the position that I'm maintaining. <coughs> because, and therefore, it will follow that it cannot be an analytic proposition uh, ever to say that this or that exists. And take, for example, suppose you take as your subject the existent round square. It would look like an analytic proposition that the existent round square exists. But it doesn't exist. No, it doesn't. Then surely you can't say it doesn't exist unless you have a conception of what existence is. As to the phrase, existent round square, I should say that it has no meaning at all. I quite agree. Then I should say the same thing in another context in reference to a necessary being. Well, we seem to have arrived at an impasse. To say that a necessary being is a being that must exist and cannot not exist has for me a definite meaning. For you it has no meaning. Well, we can press the point a little, I think. A being that must exist and cannot not exist would surely, according to you, be a being whose essence involves existence. Yes, a being the essence of which is to exist. But I should not be willing to argue the existence of God simply from the idea of his essence, because I don't think we have any clear intuition of God's essence as yet. I think we have to argue from the world of experience to God. Yes, I quite see the distinction. But at the same time, for a being with sufficient knowledge, it would be true to say, here is this being whose essence involves existence. Yes, certainly, if anybody saw God, he would see that God must exist. So, it, I mean, there is a being whose essence involves existence, although we don't know that essence. We only know there is such a being. Yes, I should add, we don't know the essence a priori. It is only true a posteriori, through our experience of the world, that we come to a knowledge of the existence of that being. And then, one argues, the essence and existence must be identical. Because if God's essence and God's existence were not identical, then some sufficient reason for this existence would have to be found beyond God. So it all turns on this question of sufficient reason. And uh, I must say, you haven't defined sufficient reason in a way that I can understand. What do you mean by sufficient reason? You don't mean cause. Not necessarily. Cause is a kind of sufficient reason. Only contingent being can have a cause. God is his own sufficient reason but he is not cause of himself. By sufficient reason in the full sense, I mean an explanation adequate for the existence of some particular being. But when is an explanation adequate? Suppose I am about to make a flame with a match. You may say that the adequate explanation of that is that I rub it on the box. Well, for practical purposes, but theoretically that's only a partial explanation. An adequate explanation must ultimately be a total explanation to which nothing further can be added. Then I can only say you're looking for something which can't be got and which one ought not to expect to get. To say that one has not found it is one thing. To say that one should not look for it seems to me rather dogmatic. What I'm doing is to look for the reason, in this case, in this case the cause, of the objects, the real or imagined totality of which constitute what we call the universe. You say, I think, that the universe, or my existence, if you prefer, or any other existence, is unintelligible. I shouldn't say unintelligible. I think it is without explanation. Intelligible, to my mind, is a different thing. Intelligible has to do with the thing itself, intrinsically, and not with its relations. Well, my point is that what we call the world is intrinsically unintelligible, apart from the existence of God. You see, I don't believe that the infinity of the series of events, I mean a horizontal uh, series, so to speak, if such an infinity could be proved, would be in the slightest degree relevant to the situation. If you add up chocolates, you get chocolates after all, and not a sheep. If you add up chocolates to infinity, you presumably get an infinite number of chocolates. So if you add up contingent being to infinity, you still get contingent beings, not a necessary being. An infinite series of contingent beings would be, to my way of thinking, as unable to cause itself as one contingent being. However, you say, I think, that it is illegitimate to raise the question of what will explain the existence of any particular object. 
It's quite all right if you mean by explaining it, simply finding a cause for it. Well, why stop at one particular object? Why shouldn't one raise the question of the cause of the existence of all particular objects? Because I see no reason to think there is any. The whole concept of cause is one we derive from our observation of particular things. I see no reason whatsoever to suppose that the total has any cause whatsoever. I can illustrate what seems to me to be your fallacy. Every man who exists has a mother, and it seems to be your argument is, therefore the human race must have a mother. But obviously the human race hasn't a mother. That's a different logical sphere. Well, I can't really see a parity. If I was saying every object has a phenomenal cause, therefore the whole series has a phenomenal cause, there would be a parity. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying every object has a phenomenal cause, if you insist on the infinity of the series, but the series of phenomenal causes is an insufficient explanation of the series. Therefore, the series has not a phenomenal cause, but a transcendent cause. Well, that's always assuming that not only every particular thing in the world, but the world as a whole, must have a cause. For that assumption, I see no ground whatever. If you'll give me a ground, I'll listen to it. Well, the series of events is either caused or it's not caused. If it is caused, there must obviously be a cause outside the series. If it's not caused, then it's sufficient to itself. And if it's sufficient to itself, it is what I call necessary. But it can't be necessary, since each member is contingent. And we've agreed that the total is no reality apart from the members. Therefore, it can't be necessary. And I should like to observe in passing that the statement that the world is simply there and is inexplicable can't be got out of logical analysis. I cannot see how science could be conducted on any other assumption than that of order and intelligibility in nature. The physicist presupposes, at least tacitly, that there is some sense in investigating nature and looking for the causes of events, just as the detective presupposes that there is some sense in looking for the cause of a murder. The metaphysician assumes that there is sense in looking for the reason or cause of phenomena. And not being a Kantian, I consider that the metaphysician is as justified in his assumption as the physicist. When Sartre, for example, says the world is gratuitous, I think that he hasn't sufficiently considered what is implied by gratuitous. I think there seems to be a certain unwarrantable extension here. The physicist looks for causes. That does not necessarily imply that there are causes everywhere. A man may look for gold without assuming that there is gold everywhere. If he finds gold, well and good. If he doesn't, he's had bad luck. The same is true with the physicists look for causes. As for Sartre, I don't profess to know what he means, and I shouldn't like to be thought to interpret him. But for my part, I do think the notion of the world having an explanation is a mistake. I don't see why one should expect it to have. Your general point, then, Lord Russell, is that it's illegitimate even to ask the question of the cause of the world. Yes, that's my position. Well, if it's a question that for you has no meaning, it's, of course, very difficult to discuss it, isn't it? Yes, it is very difficult. What do you say? Shall we pass on to some other issue? Let's. Well, perhaps I might say a word about religious experience.